Michael, you've written that the fine-tuning of the universe is the best argument for a theological perspective. Why did you say that? Well, if I was a theist, uh, which I once was, I would make that argument because um, the natural explanation for the fine-tuning is, uh, is not all that great. And I, I, I don't think either side has a scientific explanation. I think it, at that point, uh, ends up being theological and metaphysical, but not physics. Well, the, the fine-tuning is remarkable. We all understand that. How do you explain it? Well, I think there's a number of approaches to take. One is that, in general, I think it's a little early in the history of science to say we know enough about the physical universe and the laws of physics to say absolutely this is the final explanation for how we got here and it needs some other explanation than a natural one. I think we do not have a unified theory of physics, for example. We can't unify, uh, say, uh, quantum gravity and, and relativity and global general relativity and so on, such that there still may be a single equation that explains all of the different fine-tuned numbers, and therefore the mystery will disappear. Okay, agree with that, but in the last 20 years, some of the leading scientists are saying that we're never going to find that final theory. So if we don't, where are you then? Well, first of all, I, I'm always skeptical of anybody that says we're never going to find X because... Well, we have to assume one or the other. If, if, we, if we find it, I agree. Yeah. I'm with you. If we don't? And if we don't? Okay, if we don't. Um, first of all, I think it's a reasonable theory, just as good as the theological answer, to say that there are multiple bubble universes. Ours is just one of many universes. And each of these universes has different, slightly different laws of nature. Any universe that has laws of nature similar to ours will give rise to stars and planets and perhaps beings that ask questions about how unusual it is that it's fine-tuned for beings that can ask questions like that. Um, and if you have enough of these bubble universes, somebody's bound to win the lottery and become us. And, and I think it's a little anthropocentric to think we're the only bubble universe like this. Granted, there's no empirical evidence for these other bubble universes. But I think a reasonable argument is that in the long history of science, we have gone from the Earth is the center of the universe with the stars just on the outside and God looking in to the galaxy being the entire known universe to a collection of galaxies being the entire known universe to multiple sure. bubble universes. And that it's always been our downfall to think now we know enough to say this is definitively it and then, lo and behold, something else expands us even further. Uh, and I think that's the nat next natural step. But where we have come in the last few decades is looking at some of these fundamental constants of nature and seeing an extraordinarily tight range required for not just one, but maybe a half dozen or more of these, including the cosmological constant, which controls the speed of the expansion of the universe, which some say has to be accurate to 60 decimal places. Mm -hmm. You know, nine decimal places is a billion and 18 is a billion billion and they're at 60. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? <laughs> okay, what do you do with that? Well, you say, okay, therefore there must be a God that designed it that way. Or you say there are multiple bubble universes and if there's enough of them, one of them's bound to be at that parameters. Or you say, beats me, I don't know. It's okay to not know and leave it as an unsolved mystery. What most people are uncomfortable doing is with that third step, is, is our tolerance for ambiguity is fairly low. And in science, I think it's reasonable to have a high tolerance for ambiguity and just say, I don't know. And that's an okay position to be at. You don't have to conclude there is a God or there are multiple bubble universes. You can just say, I don't know, let's do some more research and see what happens. Do you consider that similar to the brute fact concept that some philosophers would say? They'd use this wonderful term, brute fact, and it's like a, a big stone and it's there and it's an immovable object and once you get it, it's no further. You like that term? Um, I like that term, yes. <laughs> I, it's not something I would use, but, um, I, but for me personally, uh, I, I'm comfortable saying I don't know. I don't have a f 
full satisfying explanation for that, nor do we have one for a lot of other subjects like consciousness, for example. It's just okay to say, I don't know, and, and be comfortable with that, because there's a lot of things we don't know. But we want to push that. We want to push against that. I mean, I, I feel a passion and a compulsion to push against that, and not just to sit satisfied with I don't know. Well, sure, let's continue with the research. If, uh, you know, if we can find out more information, if we, perhaps the LIGO experiments will show that uh, there is leakage of gravity waves from another universe, oh my God, okay, there's some evidence for another universe. Maybe that might happen, and that would be great if that happens. But until then, let's just say that's an interesting mystery. Let's wait and see what happens.